The president wants to spy on 200 million Americans without a warrant. Has he read this document which he was sworn to uphold? Now, I will not have you libel Abraham Lincoln. I don't understand the problem with registering guns. We register cars. Mark Levine brings you the news the government doesn't want you to know. Today, an explosive story about connections between white supremacists and Islamic terrorists. When there's a conflict between Scalia's conservative values and the Constitution of the United States, he throws away the Constitution. When we do have secret prisons, that is not what America is all about. Let's go to Mark in five, four, three, two. Good evening, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. The Occupy DC protests are now six weeks old. Uh, they began, of course, as an offshoot of Occupy Wall Street in New York City. In fact, there are Occupy movements in hundreds of cities across the United States and across the globe. Recently, there was an incident involving a car uh, mowing down four of the protesters, a confrontation with D.C. police who refused to take witness statements. We're going to give you all those facts in just a few minutes. First of all, I do want to make clear that in Virginia, there is an election tomorrow. You may not be aware of it. You probably are, but let's face it, Virginia has elections on strange off years. Uh, most states have them on the even years. Tomorrow is election day. It is your responsibility as an American citizen to get out and vote, and I want to encourage you to do so. There are a lot of very good candidates running. Uh, in my home district, I'm going to be voting for Adam Eben, uh, but, uh, I want to, and, and David England. I want to encourage you to vote for whomever you want to vote for. Uh, I will say this, though. The Senate, the Virginia Senate, is very closely split between the Republicans and the Democrats. The Republicans control the governorship. The Republicans control the House. If Republicans win two seats, the Republicans will have complete control of Virginia. They'll be able to gerrymander the state so that Republicans only win in Virginia in the future, and be able to do things that Republicans want to do. Things like making sure that, for example, that there's more guns uh, on the street, that people can bring guns into bars and restaurants, uh, trying to do what they can to require religion to be taught in schools. The Republicans have a long agenda on a lot of different issues. And if you support them, obviously you'll want them to take over. If you feel that you want a more moderate, limited split government in Virginia, you'll want to vote for the Democrats so that you have that split government. But whatever you decide, please get out and vote tomorrow. It is your responsibility. Now I want to move on to Occupy DC. I spent a lot of time with Occupy DC over the weekend, getting to know them, them getting to know me. And I got to say, I was pretty impressed with what I saw. I saw people from all walks of life coming together with a common goal. Uh, the goal may be amorphous. It's hard sometimes to pin down a specific goal. But really, it's a goal that the 99% of Americans who are not super wealthy, the 99% of us who are the middle class, who are the people working hard, playing by the rules, trying to live the American dream, that we should have a voice to. And one of the nice things about Occupy DC is I saw people young and old. I saw people black and white and Latino and Asian and every mix of people, men and women, that you can imagine. Everything from children to the elderly, everything from highly educated people to uneducated people, getting together and supporting a common goal. Now, you may be aware of the fact that uh, there was some confrontation recently between Occupy DC and the Koch brothers who funded a gathering recently at the Washington Convention Center, actually Friday night, called Americans for Prosperity. I don't know if you know who the Koch brothers are, but you should. And I got to really praise Occupy DC for bringing them to our attention. The Koch brothers, Charles and David Koch, are somewhere across between Mr. Burns on The Simpsons and Uncle Scrooge. Only they're far richer, far more dangerous, and far more evil than Mr. Burns and Uncle Scrooge. Let me try to convey the power of Charles and David Koch, who are some of the richest people in the United States of America. I think they're fourth and fifth on the list. Each one has about $25 billion. So they have about $50 billion between them. Uh, the second largest private corporation in America is theirs. What the Koch brothers have done is they are out to destroy working people in America. That's their goal, let's face it. They're one of the first things they want to destroy is unions. So with a flip of their hands, the Koch brothers can fire tens of thousands of people or deny health care to tens of thousands of people. One of the best things they're known for is pollution. They like to, for example, pour aviation fuel into our rivers. They have been cited uh, again and again and again, 
tens of thousands of times for uh, committing fraud, for lying, for uh, causing pollution, for uh, all kinds of things. Frankly, all you have to do is look on the web and you will find there is a large number of things they've done. So like Mr. Burns, uh, they can send out the hounds, as it were. Uh, not so much dogs, but basically ruining people's lives. With a flick of the switch, as I said, they can make sure that thousands of people are denied health care. And one of the best ways they do that is by buying our politicians. In fact, I think it's fair to say the Republican Party today is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Koch brothers. They own the Republican Party. And the, we, the way they buy the Republican Party is precisely through these shadowy groups like, quote, Americans for Prosperity, unquote, the group that was meeting in a convention hall on Friday night. Now, whereas Occupy DC has a budget of, I don't know, a few hundred dollars, people trying to eat and build tents, maybe, maybe a few thousand dollars, the Koch brothers and Americans for Prosperity has a budget in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Where do they get all their money? They won't tell us. Maybe it's from Chinese dictators, maybe it's from Libyan dictators, Saudi dictators, maybe it's just from, I don't know, the mob. It doesn't matter, they refuse to tell us. One of the things that the Koch brothers fervently believe in is their right to buy politicians and not have us know where the money is coming from. They, of course, have been aided in doing that by the United States Supreme Court, at least five members of whom, in the Citizens United case, found that corporations are people, even though in my constitution, there's absolutely no mention of, con of corporations at all. They're not in the uh, Constitution of the United States. They're not in the Declaration of Independence. But the Koch brothers, through their various assets, are able to buy politicians who appoint judges to the bench who have no respect for the Constitution of the United States. And five of them have declared not only that corporations are people, but that these corporations, these multinational corporations, financed by evil people like the Koch brothers, and let's face it, uh, multinational interests all around the globe, can buy our politicians and can do so with unlimited funds, despite the fact that the American people have voted to limit the funds by which corporations can buy politicians, these five members of the Supreme Court disregarded the Constitution and said, you know what, screw the American people, let's let the multinational corporations control our politicians. So that's the law as it is. You may know the Democrats tried to modify the law somewhat to say, all right, if we're gonna have the Koch brothers own our politicians like marionettes, at least disclose it, at least require it so we know, okay, Boehner's bought for a million dollars and you know, Cantor's bought for two million, whatever the, the money is, if you're gonna bribe a politician, it's gonna be legal, let's find out how much that it costs. I mean, you know, which politicians can you get cheap? Which ones can you just go through the drive through and pick up for a million dollars or so? And which ones do the Koch brothers have to shut up two, three, maybe even five million dollars to buy? As you may well know, that Disclosure Act was filibustered by the Republicans because they insist that secret shadowy forces have complete control over our government. They do not want to have this disclosure. In any case, the Koch brothers are the epitome of, of this. Not only being uh, people worth $50 million, fourth and fifth is rich in the United States. Frankly, they're in the top 20 richest people in the world. Uh, combine them together and they're up in the top 10. Uh, these people, as I say, control vast industries all across the country. They're the ones financing Scott Walker. They're the ones doing the most union bashing, trying to destroy unions all across the country, trying to, wait to take away people's health care. I have no doubt that people have died because the Koch brothers have taken away the health care of workers in their industries or worked to take away other people's fighting for their health care in America. But it's not just that. They're up there in the top 10 polluters. If your air is, is messed up, if your water is unclean, thank the Koch brothers. So I want you to imagine the scene. Here you've got David Koch. And we know he was there in that convention center on Friday night. He's sitting up on the third floor. If you go and you look on the web, you actually see his view. And outside his window, one of the richest billionaires, multi-billionaires in America, a guy, like I said, who can snuff people's lives out with just a snap of his hands, and he looks out, and there's the 99%. There's the rest of America. There are people out in the streets saying, hey, if you want to destroy our lives, if you want to destroy the middle class, we're not going to physically fight you, but you have to walk past our faces if you want to leave the buildings. You have to endure our chance. You have to maybe, maybe just look into yourself and say, why are we financing this evil? 
why are we encouraging politicians, paying off politicians, frankly, to support polluters, to destroy unions, to do all the things the Koch brothers are famous for doing? Most Americans don't even know who the Koch brothers are. Here you have some of those evil people in America, and most Americans don't even know who they are. Well, now the Koch brothers get known. Their fake group, Americans for Prosperity, financed uh, by all these uh, uh, you know, unregulated donations from multinational corporations. That gets found out, and it's all due to Occupy DC. So I want to thank them for what they did. But let's face it, there are incidents out there. And the Koch brothers and others are trying to use the incidents to try to take down Occupy DC. So what really happened at the convention center Friday night? I've got some video I'm going to try to show you on later in the hour. It's kind of jumpy. It's taken from cell phones. It's not that clear. I admit that. Uh, but let's start with the claim by conservative activists that a grandma was pushed downstairs. And this is a pretty serious claim because Occupy DC prides itself on being nonviolent. They pride themselves on being a peaceful protest. They pride themselves on being able to work with police to make sure that while their voices are heard, they are making sure that they are nonviolent and all they're doing is yelling at people who support the Koch brothers but rather than, frankly, you know, taking, fighting this evil with their own hands. They are not doing that. They are following the law. Well, they were accused Friday night of pushing a woman down the stairs. She herself made the accusation. It's a really awful accusation. So I went to the website, uh, the YouTube clip, from the conservatives, this is a group called Conservative, right? To see their clip of what they claim is the woman being pushed down the stairs. This is their best evidence, and I thought I'd see it for myself, because, you know, I certainly don't support pushing a woman down the stairs. Let's see what they claim happened. Here's the video. Okay, you see people entering the center. I see people privacy is not stopping them from entering the center. Now, I want you to check. I stopped the tape. Check out the woman in the orange. Keep watching that orange. Luckily, she's wearing a very bright colored dress, and so you can see exactly what happens to her. She is being guided out. See? Watch her. She's being guided out through the crowd. She's going out. Okay. The camera turns. There she is on the left. Now she's off to the left. Now, look, stop. Note, she's still there. She's still on the stairs, she's on top of the stairs. No one has pushed her down the stairs, which in the view of the camera is in front of her. Okay. Now, I want you to watch this police officer. He's got a white shirt on. All right. Watch the police officer. He's going to push the crowd forward. Watch very closely the woman in orange and the police officer in white. Did you see what I saw? I'm going to show it to you again. The police officer, and I don't think he did this on purpose, is trying to get people out of the way. He says, get out of the way. Listen to him. You know, go. Go on. Let's go. Get out of the way. He pushes through the crowd. He pushes some people who push this unfortunate woman down the stairs. Watch it again, because again, this is the conservative video. And I don't want anyone to accuse Occupy DC of doing something that a police officer inadvertently did. Again, I don't think the police officer did it on purpose. But I want the record to be clear that, unfortunately, this police officer made a mistake trying to help people, trying to clear the crowd for whatever reason. He pushes people who push. See the woman in the orange dress? See it on the top left of the screen? Watch her. He pushes. She goes down. Did you catch that? He says, let's go. Let's go. And he pushes. And he pushes some people. And she goes down. I'm going to show it to you one more time because I want this allegation to go to rest right here. All right? There's the woman in orange. You see her. She's got a very clear, very clear dress on. You see the orange at the bottom left of your screen. The police officer comes in white. He says, let's go, let's go. He pushes hard. He pushes some people who push her down the stairs. By the way, the people are in suits. I somehow doubt that's the Occupy DC people because they don't usually wear suits. Watch it one last time before we go to break. Did you see it? Let's go, let's go. He pushes the man in the suit. He unfortunately pushes the woman down the stairs. I feel bad the woman was pushed down the stairs, 
And uh, I'm sorry to say that someone in a suit was pushed by a police officer. Them's the breaks. Uh, we'll be right back. Uh, if you want to call in, the toll-free number, it, it's 571-749-1166. Actually, I'm told to keep going. All right, let's keep going. If you want to call in, uh, the number is 571-749-1166, and you can tell me what you saw or heard that night. Uh, the reason I'm going on is that uh, my guests are here. Uh, my guests were the victims of the attack uh, by a car. We're going to get to specifically what happened right after this break. get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. All right. Get Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets. We give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placement so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over a hundred years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, we don't just help people, we help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Guys, 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 stop, stop playing. No. 127 seconds. Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. the inside scoop. I'm sitting here. To my left is Heidi Sippel and Landon Sippel. Uh, Heidi and Landon are from Vidalia, Ohio, and they came to Washington, D.C. Well, I'll, I'll let them tell the story for themselves. Uh, Heidi and Landon, welcome to the inside scoop. Thank you very much. Tell me, why did you come to Washington, D.C.? Um, we came both uh, for Landon to uh, see some Smithsonian. He's a, a pilot, wants to uh, be make a career out of it. A and pilot? So, uh, yeah. How old are you, Landon? 13. So you're a wannabe pilot. I don't yeah. think you're oh, flying. He flies. Flying. No, he's oh, he really? flies. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. That's very impressive. Well, we thought we would see the Smithsonian and visit some sites, and we knew that there was a uh, protest going on uh, with the Occupy DC, so we came. Uh, we were going to participate a little bit in that and uh, show them uh, what democracy looked like <laughs> here in the U.S. Well, I think um, maybe Landon learned, learned the hard way what <laughs> Uh, democracy looks like. Why did you decide to uh, join uh, the protest Occupy DC? Uh, I mean, we have, you know, the entire movement, each person kind of has something that's special to them. Our uh, issues kind of health care and uh, general reform with that. And then, of course, college that will be uh, interested for him and my wife, who uh, is pregnant with our second son. Uh, and so some of our personal issues uh, in dealing with that. I tried to get her up here. We just don't have enough room on the stage. So my, oh, my apologies saying? to Brandy. She's not that pregnant. No, 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 no. It, it's, please. <laughs> Only room for three people. Right. Yes. Uh, but we, we're certainly very glad to have you here in studio okay. as well. So you came to join the Occupy DC protest, mm -hmm. and then I was already telling my listeners how Friday night you were protesting the Koch Brothers Conference yes. uh, with their uh, Americans for Prosperity, which mm -hmm. has a budget in the hundreds of millions of dollars. It's amazing. And yet, I don't know how many protesters were out there uh, disrupting think, this uh, yeah. convention hall. I think we've had about 500 uh, strong. Pretty good. Yeah. I was just saying that David Koch is a rich man. He could snuff mm -hmm. out thousands and thousands of lives, and yet yeah. uh, a few uh, people in, in D.C. managed to uh, disrupt his party a little bit. Now, um, you folks were outside the convention? We were, indeed. Okay. There's been claims that, uh, that you were blocking people 
it going in and out. Were you doing any of that? Uh, we weren't personally. I know that some of the other demonstrators were uh, involved in that, um, but we personally were just uh, at an intersection that was physically blocked by police cars with um, my young son and, and the pregnancy. It wasn't a good idea to be involved in too much of that, so we were there just as a visual. Okay, so there is a visual. You're at an intersection outside the convention center. I should tell you before, about a few minutes, before what happened to you happened, and this is something that you didn't know about until later. Yes. Uh, and so we're gonna have witnesses that are gonna tell this incident, but just so we get it chronologically uh, here, there was a protester by the name of Georgia, and she was hit by a car by a man in a silver Lexus uh, who hit her in a crosswalk, she, she said today at a press conference. She was hit at the crosswalk, it was underneath the, if you know DC, if it was underneath the uh, skywalk that connects the convention center. Um, even though the roads were blocked off by police, this man hit her, uh, and we're going to actually bring some witnesses in who actually saw that. I'll get to that in a second. But apparently, a few minutes after hitting her, he made around the corner, and this man found you. Yeah, he sure did. Um, in the um, uh, aftermath of, of him leaving that accident, he actually sped around the corner to the street uh, that we were facing. Um, Landon and I and my wife were had formed in a line that had formed a, a caddy corner across the intersection. Like I said, it was just a visual because we did have the police who were blocking the lanes physically right. for us. Right. Um, we saw him coming down. He was coming down the correct side of the street. He was coming south uh, on the southbound side. Um, he uh, turned. Wait, was he on the right? The he was on the correct side initially, and then when he approached the intersection, he sort of came across the intersection. He was traveling southbound on the northbound side, so the wrong. So he, he went from the right side of the street to the wrong side of the street. Right, exactly. Right in front of you. Right in front of us. Uh, most people, we had had a, a you know a sprinkling of cars that had come down that way uh, occasionally, and when they would, we weren't uh, you know demanding that they stay. Most of them who came down were part of us, the 99%. So they were just trying to get home. We let them through. Uh, we had buses, we had police cars, we had a few ambulances. How long had you been out there? Three hours, just uh, just under three hours we had actually been in that location. And um, so, uh, you know, as uh, he came down and crossed the intersection, he stopped in front of us just by a few feet. And when he did that, uh, he uh, threw his hands up into the air and, um, and then just gunned it and uh, ran right here into the, the, the well, crowd. My, my now, wait a minute. He, he, he kind of stopped the car or slowed down he did, the car? No, he came to a, to a full stop there, and we were... On the wrong of, side of the, the street right facing you. In the middle of the intersection facing us. And so when you see a guy on the wrong side of the street stopped in a car facing you, you yeah. don't really perceive a threat, I take it. I, I mean, we, we initially were concerned about that, but because he came to this uh, stop there, we were kind of watching him to see what he was going to do. Was he going to turn left? Did he want us to move out of the way? What was, you know, where did we need to move to be out of his way? You know, mm -hmm. we can. Yeah, he's uh, on the wrong side yeah, of the street. Yeah, where are we trying going. to go here, guy? Right, right. So uh, we, that's what we did. We just watched him. He was only there for a split second. He threw his arms up in the air I, I, uh, and then just hit the gas. And uh, um, he hit Landon and I with the car. Uh, my wife was able to get out of the way and it, it just kind of uh, breezed her on the, the side her. there. Yeah, grazed her there. But Landon and I were hit. And, Landon, tell me what you remember. Um, basically, when he got down there, um, he just kind of, uh, uh, he was standing, or he was sitting in his car, yeah. and he stopped, and he threw his hands up, put his hands on the show, seat. Show me how he threw his hands up. Just kind of like, threw his hands like, up like, like this, like he was like, upset. Yeah, like he was of. upset, mm -hmm. like, and then just put his hands on the steering wheel and just gunned it at us, and... I ended up. That's uh, pretty scary, right? See yeah. A car yeah. It's right shocking. You? And so I ended up on the hood. On the hood of the car. Yeah. I felt I like because it was above, it was above my knees, so I was bent over and I hit my head on the hood. And then she was next to me, so she ended up on there. Well, like not really, because she saw me and she was behind me a mm -hmm. little bit of ways. And so she ended up behind me, and. Um, then I started like backpedaling and my feet were almost under, so I kind of lifted my feet up. And, and so he was still going. He didn't he was stop still after going. he hit you. He didn't he stop didn't at all. He didn't slow down. Not at all. Just actually went faster. And uh, she pushed me off and jumped to the side, and the car hit her legs, and she hit her head, and she was briefly knocked unconscious. Well, let me <laughs> switch back to you yeah. then. So you see this car heading toward you, and I guess it hit your son first? Yeah, it kind of hit us simultaneously. Uh, I guess uh, I had 
you know, kind of backed up a little, as much as I could and put my hand on the car and was trying to, to move myself backwards. Uh, Landon, it hit him kind of at the waist. He's a little bit taller than I am. So uh, it kind of knocked him over on the hood of the car. And I looked over to him. Both of us were just trying to get backwards as quickly as we could. And I knew that if we quickly did not get out of the way, he was going to run us over. Uh, he had no one, he never slowed down. So I just took my son and I just shoved him as hard as I could to the right and I just dove to the left. When I dove to the left, the car struck me um, in my lower legs, and you know, uh, that kind of set me tumbling. I hit my head, and, and like you said, for a brief second, I... And, and you ended up having a head injury. Yeah, a concussion and uh, some, some whiplash mus muscle things. Luckily, no bones were broken, and... Uh, and you were taken to the hospital, Yes. the, the three of you. Mm -hmm. Now, um, to me, what's interesting, and I'm going to get to the witnesses who saw the incident in a minute so they can give what they saw, sure. but... Uh, you're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you're, you're wheeled off there. You have no time to give a statement to police or anything because yeah. you're injured. But you're actually in the hospital, mm -hmm. and you're being wheeled in to get a, a scan. A CAT scan, yes. I, I, they had taken me into the trauma room, and it, everything happened very quickly. If you've been in a trauma, they cut all your clothes off. Yikes. They get very personal very wow. quickly. Uh, there's not a lot of exchanging of names. And uh, it, then uh, they rush you. They, they want to quickly know if you've got any kind of head injury, uh, and they do a, a CAT scan of your, your abdomen and see if there's any internal bleeding. So after they had, we had rushed through this whole process, they were rushing me into a CAT scan. And, um, Are you like naked in a robe behind yeah, you? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm laying flat on the bed with just a sheet over uh -huh. top of me and people everywhere, very confusing. And you see chaos. a police officer? Uh, I actually could barely just uh, glimpse her for a second. Um, I heard her This is Officer Lee. Officer Lee, yes. Um, she's the one who signed our tickets, which I'll get to in a second. But um, sh I just could see her just uh, a, a briefly. Uh, she was talking to the nurse, and the nurse explained that she needed to wait until we had. I was done with uh, X-ray. Uh, she said it'll only take a second. I just need to drop these off. She said uh, I'm issuing you a citation um, for don't walk for walking against a don't walk sign and for obstructing traffic. Um, the investigation on the scene. I talked to 20 people, but only two people were uninvolved, and they said that. You, that the light was green and that you had a don't walk sign. Uh, she then put the tickets on the end of my bed and I asked her if he was being charged and it, when I could make my statement and she just walked away. So you asked specifically to make a yes. statement against the driver yes. of the car and she walked away. Yes. So she apparently couldn't wait till you get an x-ray no. to see whether you have a concussion or not. No. She had to give you your it was don't walk hard, yeah. trespassing <laughs> ticket. What's the citation? $20? It's, uh, a, it's a total of $30. $30? All yeah. right. So she had to get that to it's you. It's very important. But when you wanted to give the statement of the it driver so against important. the driver, she walked away. Not All right. So important. When we come back, we're going to hear from some other witnesses to the incident. You've heard from Heidi and Landon. What about the people who saw the incident? Uh, we're going to have uh, Drew Vaser and Todd Waters. They were uh, witnesses to not just, I believe, we'll, we'll hear from them, not just the incident that hit you, but also the car hitting another young woman earlier on. We're getting to the bottom of this on the inside scoop. If you want to call in, 571-749-1166. Right back. After Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact cfripp at aol.com. kids have trouble with their eyesight but that's not always the case 
Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems, and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message. Here again, the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, here with two more Occupy DC protesters. Uh, they're not just here as protesters, but also as witnesses to the accident you just heard about. Before we get to the incident, I just want to get a little background on who you are and why you joined Occupy DC movement. Let me start with you, Drew. Uh, so my name's Drew Vasey. I'm a, um, I work downtown, and I decided to join the movement because this country needs a change in the system. Todd? Yeah, um, my name's Todd Waters. Um, I'm a University of Maryland student. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to see a change. I, I think there's a lot of problems that are affecting our country, both politically and economically. We need to do something about it. Okay, so both of you were participating in the march against the Koch brothers, Americans for Prosperity. Mm -hmm. I have detailed for our listeners exactly who the Koch brothers are, and I describe them as a cross between uh, Uncle Scrooge and the uh, and Mr. Burns of the Simpsons, but making clear they're far more evil and dangerous than than those two put together. Um, and rich, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, let me get right to what happened to uh, um, to Heidi Sippel and her family. Before I get to her, Drew, you witnessed an incident that occurred to a young woman by the name of Georgia a few minutes before the incident, uh, before what happened to Heidi Sippel, right? Uh, yeah. What did you see? Uh, well, this happened probably less than two minutes, maybe less than one minute uh, before the Sippel family was hit. We were underneath the skywalk uh, in the Washington Convention Center, and um, there was there was demonstrators in the road in the crosswalk. If you if you're familiar with the Washington Convention Center, under the skywalk, it has a very wide crosswalk. Very large. Um, that demonstrators were in, and I was sitting. And by the way, under DC law, cars are supposed to uh, wait uh, for and to yield to to people in the crosswalk. Uh, that's something that all drivers in DC should know. Mm -hmm. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, and so I was sitting, I was sitting on the sidewalk at the time, facing the facing the street, and uh, from the periphery of my vision, a silver Lexus came up to the line of demonstrators and slowed. There was few words exchanged. I think I was I was far enough away that I could not hear something like that. And then uh, the driver just drove right into uh, Georgia, and she rolled up on the hood and then rolled off. And Just mowed right into them. Yeah, it was pretty deliberate. It was fairly odd. It was, you, you, because the car had slowed down to, to meet them and then sped up again. Georgia is uh, in her 20s, I guess? I think, I think so. She's, she's a young woman, and she was in there, the crosswalk with everybody else. Was, were there a lot of people there? Was she, did she like not get out of the way in time? How, how, why did he hit her? He's just unlucky? I, yeah, I, I guess. I guess it was just unlucky because there, weren't, there were more people on the sidewalks at the time than there were in the street. Uh, this was the, one of the only cars that came down that particular road under the convention center because all the other intersections had been blocked off. Uh, blocked off by police? Yeah, blocked up, blocked up by police. By and, police and cars who were facilitating your being in the street without being run over. Yeah, so we were, um, as part of the event, the convention center is a huge complex, but we had a lot of demonstrators, and so the idea was to surround the convention center. And, um, well, uh, Georgia could not get out of the way of the car in time. and um, So the car hit her? Yep. And she fell down? Yeah, and that's when I stood up because I, when she got hit, I stood up because there was a lot of people around and um, there were medics on the on the scene, and I'm not really trained in real first aid. But then the car didn't really kept going, and it was going pretty slowly, but it wasn't but it wasn't stopping there. I didn't see any brake lights, and that's when the so you were concerned that the driver was just going to try to get away. And that's when I uh, started chasing after him. Okay. And I chased him. Uh, the Silver Lexus turned a corner and the, turned a corner uh, towards another line of demonstrators at 
uh, at an intersection that was. And you're running after him. Yes. You're shouting stop, stop, or something like that. Yeah. I, I, well, I know the guy won't stop, but I'm shouting to the other demonstrators to stop, stop him, stop him, stop him, stop that guy, stop that guy, because, uh, well, just for, just to not let him get away with it, mm -hmm. uh, because there were far more demonstrators at this at the intersection that the Sipples were hit at mm -hmm. than at the crosswalk where Georgia was hit at. I see. And then I just had to witness it from behind where the Silver Lexus, it just, it happened so fast, it just parted the, pro the protesters. It was ghastly, like a movie. It was, and then he kept, he kept, and after he had basically parted the protesters, he kept going, and luckily, at the next intersection that was not blocked off, there was some gigantic vehicle, like a huge truck or a bus, and it was also a red light, and so he couldn't get... He, he couldn't he, get away. He couldn't, he, even if he wanted to run the red light, he couldn't get away. He would have hit a huge vehicle. And so you caught up with him there? Yeah, along with a lot of other demonstrators. Before I get to the rest of your story, Todd, I want to know what you saw that evening. Okay, um, I was at the second inter intersection, and unfortunately... Near the Sipples. Near the Sipples. I was right next to them. Uh, they were to my right um, as the Lexus approached. Unfortunately, um, I, I don't know if it was the revving of the engine, but we couldn't hear um, Drew in his shouting of, to stop the vehicle. Um, the car came to a, uh, a stop right in front of us and then uh, kind of bumped its way like into our legs. And, uh, that's did, did it hit you too? Uh, yes, actually, um, uh, but not hard. I was able to uh, basically get out of the way. It just barely glanced me. But um, the sipples were pinned in front of the vehicle as it started to accelerate. And there's a whole bunch of people here. It's not just you and the sipples. Oh, yeah. It was how, how many people? 10, uh, 20, 30? 30. 30. Really? Yeah. Um, they just plowed right into them. Plowed right them. into them. Um, so all the sipples were pinned to the front of the car, basically, as it started accelerating. And they rolled off, um, so, you know, uh, one after the other as it sped towards the next intersection, um, trying to flee the scene. So what did you do? What were your thoughts? Well. Actually, um, I, I also sprinted right after the vehicle. Um, I saw a squad car waiting um, up at the next intersection. The police were providing like a uh, kind of a barrier for us, and so that was only one of the few cars we encountered the whole evening. Um, this is one of the barriers, the ordinary barriers that they had set up at the beginning of the perimeter mm -hmm. to, to protect really the protests from being run over by cars. Yes, yes. So, so he hit one of the sort of the natural barriers that the police had already set there. Yeah. And, um, and then, then what happened? Um, well, he's, he continued to try to flee the scene even with the uh, police car pulling him behind him. He tried to weave his way through the red light but then got stopped by a big bus that was in the way um, and then eventually... Um, did the police turn on their siren and stop the car? The police did turn on their siren, okay. um, and they pulled him over. All right. So let me go back to you, Drew. So you see the cop has pulled this guy over, mm -hmm. and you come up to the scene, I guess. Yeah. But then what happens? Uh, I don't have much more to my story. Basically, I, I was like, that guy just hit somebody, and the police were telling all of us, get back, you, get back. You told the police officer on the scene, one or two or several? Yeah, there was one in particular that, that was that was telling all the all the demonstrators who had followed to get back, get back, and... And you told this police officer what? I was, I was, I was basically just like, arrest him, arrest, arrest him. Just him. Hit, he just hit, pretty much. Yeah, he, just, he, just, he just hit some people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's fairly, it was so obvious that the police had seen what had happened, and so at that point, because there were so many demonstrators who were now, like, moved to, to that uh, intersection, that I just that I just walked away because I had just seen four people get hit by a car. I was kind of in shock. Okay, so, so but you told the police arrest him or something, and they mm -hmm. just said get back. Yeah. Uh, were there, did you see any of the police say, "Hey, any witnesses to this? Anything like that?" Uh, Todd, how about you? Yes. Um, well, actually, actually, no. Um, what happened was I, I wanted to give a, give a statement, um, and and um, when police started collecting. Um, Collecting people who 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 were witnesses and wanted to give statements, and um, how did that happen? They did they say uh, we're looking for people who are witnesses? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess that did occur. Like after after people started saying they wanted to give statements, they they did take I guess a stack as it were um, for because uh, I've seen the police report and yeah. at least for the one that hit the Sipples, there's only two quote non-involved witnesses there. Right. Well, what happened was. Um, 
I went over to uh, Sergeant Lee, who was uh, taking, well, who was supposed to be taking statements, and um, you know she wasn't writing anything down. And as I walked up and waiting for her to acknowledge me, um, her and another officer, I overheard them talking about how they could pin it on the protesters. What specifically did you hear them say? They were saying they were debating what violations or what um, policies or laws um, the, pro the siblings were in violation of. And, um, the siblings, the, the, the victims, siblings, the sorry, people sorry, who sorry. were hit. Siblings, yes, sir. Uh, you heard them say what? I don't want to put words in your mouth. So right, right. Specifically, what you remember okay. hearing? Okay. Uh, they asked um, one of the officers asked the other if a green light was um, present or during the incident. And another and another question they asked each other was. Was there um, was the crosswalk light on? And um, when they did acknowledge me, um, the first thing Sergeant Lee asked me was, "Was the cross light walk on and or light on?" Mm -hmm. And um, when I said no, it wasn't. She just walked away. Now, did you indicate that you wanted to give a statement to this officer? Yes, sir. You said, "What, what did you say? I, I want to give a statement, or I want to say what happened?" Y yes, sir. Like that. I, I said I was a witness, and um, that I wanted to give a statement. And she just walked away. Would take your statement. Yep. Now, recently, uh, just today, in fact, uh, I was at a press conference that uh, Occupy DC held, both at the two intersections where the this car attacked four people, and then um, you went down to the police station itself. What was the purpose of that action, Drew? Um, I actually had to go back to work. Okay, be, be, so you weren't you weren't so, so, so right, so I, actually. I, I, yeah. Todd. Uh, what was the purpose of, of that action? Um, actually, I wasn't part of the planning part of that, but you know, like I would say that part of that um, action would probably be to get just, you know, make sure justice was served. Well, well let me tell you what I saw since yeah. I was there, and I can say what I saw with my okay. own eyes. What I saw was Heidi uh, Sippel and others who witnessed the incident try to give statements to the police. The police were mute. They would not say a word. They kept saying, "We want to give statements. We understand we have to give statements." We had there was a lawyer there. Uh, who said under the DC code and under the act, under the um, the general order of the DC police and also under their action plans, they're required to get statements from all the witnesses. They were asked if there were any exceptions to the rules that would say that they didn't have to take witness statements, and they were just mute. Uh, that standoff lasted about 45 minutes, and the Occupy DC protesters made it clear they weren't going anywhere until the DC police followed the DC police's own procedures and allowed for the witness statements. Finally, the police did relent. They did take several witness statements, and they announced they are reopening the investigation. And I have to say, as far as I was concerned, that seemed like a victory for Occupy DC. I don't know what, what your thoughts are about it. Yeah, that was a major victory. Yeah. 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 And I think what it shows is that this is a movement, uh, and again, I'm just commenting now my own views, uh, that this is a movement that if you have police that are willing to work with them rather than against them, follow their own rules, take the statements, I think uh, that we can have some justice and hopefully this, this man who appears to have intentionally gunned down and attacked uh, four innocent people, uh, including a uh, woman and, and a 13 year old boy, hopefully this man will be put to justice. And I want to thank you both for coming here on the inside. Thank Street. you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Coming up, we've got a former Iraqi veteran who has joined the Occupy DC movement. You don't want to miss his story after this. Only you can prevent wildfires. Why don't you just wash your car at home? I wash my car. Everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? 
Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women. Here again, the inside scoop with Mark what Levine. <laughs> Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. There is, of course, an election in Virginia tomorrow. Please get out and vote. It is your responsibility as an American citizen to get out and vote. Sitting to my left now is Michael Patterson. To his left is Heidi Sippel. We've heard from her. We may get a chance to hear from her a little bit more. I want to talk with you, Michael. You are part of Occupy DC, and you have an interesting history. You are a former veteran. Yes. Where did you serve? Uh, Iraq. And well, Army, uh, Air yes, Force? Yes, Army. Uh, I was a 35 Mike, a human intelligence collector, which is just a nice way of saying interrogator. So you were an interrogator in Iraq. That's, yes. a, that's a tough business, I, I suspect. Uh, yeah. and, and you were there for how long? I was there for three months. I went with uh, SOCOM Special Operations Command, and they only had three-month deployments. So you were there deployed for three months, yes. and you just got back when? Uh, I got back in early 2009, but I got out of the Army June 7th. June 7th of this year? Yes. And you're from Alaska? Yes. Okay. Now, you decided to leave Alaska and join Occupy DC, is that right? Yes. Why? Uh, well, pretty much there are certain men who are in power and certain men who are in the corporate world who personally profit off my friends being in Afghanistan and Iraq, and that's wrong. And um, if you don't mind my asking, uh, do you have a place to live in, in D.C.? No, I, I sleep in uh, McPherson Square. You sleep in McPherson Square with, with the other occupied D.C. crowd? Yes. Now, you uh, were a witness not to the accidents, but to the aftermath of yes. the accidents. Tell me what you saw. Well, pretty much I, uh, I ran to... And I shouldn't say accidents, by the way, because yeah. it seems to me it was intentional. <laughs> so I have to watch using that yeah. word. It, it when gets... a guy guns down uh, not one, but two groups of people... Uh, I'm, I'm at least very confident saying it wasn't an accident. So Definitely. you saw two incidents, I should yes. say. You, uh, after the incident, you saw the police stop this guy? Yes. And what, what happened? What did you do? Uh, a lot of us had already stopped the vehicle as well. I know there was one uh, protester sitting in front of the vehicle. There were a, a bunch on the curb, and there was about three or four of us in the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty much what happened was uh, we were like, officer, you know, you need to arrest this guy. You need to arrest this guy. He just ran over a bunch of people. And uh, the officer pulled out a mace can and said, I'm not effing kidding, get on the effing curb. And then basically what happened was our live stream team pulled up, got the officer on, uh, his, on our live stream, and then he basically put his mace can back in. So, so, in other words, they started filming the police officer, yes, and that persuaded the officer to put his mace can back. Yep. Now, did you see people trying to give witness statements to the police? Uh, yes, I actually called for a mic check, and I said, now, wait, not everybody knows what a mic check. <laughs> oh, okay. Is. All right. Now, people who are in the Occupy movements, uh, mic check and hand motions, they know all that stuff. Please explain to the people watching what is a mic check. Uh, a mic check is basically where one person will call a mic check, and then those around him will repeat mic check, and then in short concise sentences, like two or uh, three to five words, he will say or she will say whatever needs to be said. So I, I called for a mic check. So it's kind of like amplifying without a megaphone. Exactly. One person speaks and then the 10 or 12 people around that person. A human mic. Become a human microphone. Yeah. Okay. So you called for a mic check and you said in your mic check. I said, if you witness what happened, please raise your hand. And then about eight people raised their hand. Uh, I had talked to an officer, and I said, officer, there's about eight people who saw what happened. I can get him to that street corner over there. Do you want to talk to them? And he just told me to back up, and then pretty much nothing came out of so that. So that officer wasn't at all interested in uh, interviewing the eight witnesses. That you he, uh, he, didn't even, he was like, he nodded his head, and then he told me to get on the curb, and then that was pretty much it. By the way, I should note that this particular thing, because it was filmed, is actually on the Occupy DC website. If you look, uh, this exact incident that Michael Patterson, I don't know if you know, it's on there. No. It's, described. it's kind of a jerky camera, and it's kind of hard to see sometimes. But if you look between about 25 and 30, you can actually see exactly what Michael Patterson is talking about, about 25 to 30 minutes in. 
the reason I'm not playing that on air is because there were some four-letter words by people who were very angry mm -hmm. yes, that they uh, were letting a guy who had just plowed into four innocent people get away. Okay. Don't say those words. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> th so that's why I can't show the video. But certainly people can go and see it for themselves online. Um, so since that time, uh, you were at a, another meeting today, I guess, uh, the one that I witnessed in front of the D.C. police station. Yes. And they are taking witnesses now, apparently. Yes. Okay. What's your feeling about uh, the D.C. police? Do you think they're going to be fair in this investigation? Uh, well, I mean, it's kind of a travesty, just the fact that a bunch of citizens have to march down to a police station and sit outside and... That's how you. That's how you get the police to do their jobs. And what do I think the police are going to do? I mean, it's hard to say. A lot of the cops are very aggressive there, but there are also a lot of good cops there too. So. I mean, you served in the military. You know, there's good and bad people in the military. There's yeah. good and bad police officers. Let me ask you, Heidi. This. Um, and of course, you're not from D.C. You're from Vidalia, Ohio. You go home yes. uh, tonight, I guess, or I tomorrow. Do, yes. hopefully uh, so hopefully, despite the fact that some people in Washington were not very welcome, you met a lot of very welcome oh, people here absolutely, as yeah. well. So of that's course. good uh, on behalf of our fair uh, uh, city and, and <laughs> metropolitan area. Um, the D.C. police chief, however, uh, Chief Lanier, has said that the occupied D.C. is no longer peaceful. She says that uh, it's gotten violent. She cites the fact that five people were injured. Four, of course, were the people run over by this guy, mm -hmm. uh, the, your family, the three of you, and um, uh, Georgia. The fifth is a woman who I showed the first clip, who unfortunately appears to have been knocked down the stairs by the police themselves, mm -hmm. inadvertently. Mm. Um, based on those five injuries, uh, what do you think about DC Police Chief Lanier's point? I think that uh, on our end, it's peaceful. I think that um, every person that I've met in McPherson Square and at Freedom Plaza has been very friendly. Their message has all been of peace. Certainly our message there was one of peace and, and change and there to hear our voices heard. Um, if there's any uh, aggression or frustration, I think it might be on the the part of people who aren't participating because the, they are angry. They have really uh, serious things going on in their lives, foreclosures and uh, bankruptcies and uh, um, health care issues. And so uh, everybody is frustrated. I think now everybody needs to wake up and get in the streets. Michael, you served in Iraq. I assume you saw your share of violence there. Yeah. Yeah, I would think so. Um, one of the things you told me when we first met is that when you heard about the uh, car, uh, hitting these protesters, your PTSD, your yeah. post-traumatic stress syndrome. You want to you wanna talk about a trigger. <laughs> well, tell me about that. How did that feel? Uh, honestly, it was like just a surge of adrenaline, and uh, like I'm honestly surprised it did not do anything drastic because I was literally had to pace back and forth trying to calm myself down but at the same time the police just kept making the, the whole matter worse like how did they make it worse well the fact that one a cop pulled out mace uh, a mace can on me and then uh, a lot didn't of, use it but threatened yeah, to use yeah, threatened, it threatened to use a mace can uh, two when people started to get I mean you can naturally they weren't doing their jobs and naturally people were getting more and more upset so they started uh arresting us and they started man they arrested some occupied DC yes, protesters. they arrested uh, they arrested three people uh, two uh, were pretty good friends of mine and the third guy was a photographer who's gone from occupation to occupation and he was literally trying to get someone off his bike and then the cop he was walking across the street and the cops literally just grabbed him threw his bike down and then shoved him against a car and wait, wait, wait. he's trying to get someone off his bike someone was taking his bike a or cop something? a cop had pushed somebody and he fell onto his bike and the guy was trying to help get this guy off his bike get him off so he because he'd fallen down on top yeah. of the bike and then he's tried to walk across the street and the cops just grabbed him snatched and arrested him, up, him and then slammed him against a uh, squad car and then arrested. have you heard what happened to him or the other two since then they yeah, let them all go they got released uh without think, charges they got uh, they had to pay a hundred dollars uh bail i think for a failure to obey for failure <laughs> to obey yeah uh Ooh. and now Again, you were trying to get witness statements to the police. Yes. And and they weren't interested. They were just saying back They off. were more interested in trying to antagonize us and uh, trying to get us to do something so they could arrest more of us. Now, um, but the guy in the Lexus was not arrested. No. He actually, I, I pretty much from the entire time the police got to the Lexus to the time he, they let him drive away, I saw the whole thing unfold. And they were basically, it looked like they were protecting him. 
Did they give him a drunk driving test? Maybe the guy was drunk. Make him walk a line or uh, blow no, into a He a blower honestly, or? most of the time, he stayed in his car, and then he, the, when they first let him go, he pulled off to the side, and then he got out of the car for two seconds, and then the protesters pretty much were like, already on him the minute he got out of the car and we're just like you need to go turn yourself in you need to be arrested and then he did a ue why did he get out of the car that's kind of weird i don't without know. the police around he got out yeah. of the car uh, to do was it seemingly to antagonize the protesters or no I, idea. I've literally, I mean, if it's I was, kind of a strange if thing I was to in do, a situation. You'd think if you were an angry mob, uh, you know, <laughs> you'd, you'd peel off. So so then he got back in the car and, and, and then left the, the, the cops, uh, no, he did a U-turn, drove into the middle of like probably three or four squad cars, and then we were we were on one side. We were on either side of the sidewalks on opposite sides of the street, and then we witnessed him drive off. And then, you know, and that's when I started arresting people because people pretty much had had it. And they were just like, what are you doing? And then, yeah, somebody flipped off a cop and then the cop grabbed his arm and then drug, uh, threw him down and then uh, his... Basically for flipping off a cop. Yeah, and then our... His, Which, as far as I can tell, is still not illegal in this country. I, I, I'm not recommending it. No, don't no, get me no, wrong. No, no. I'm not saying it's a good idea. There but, were, no. people, were, people were emotional and I don't blame anybody for doing what they did. Heidi, um, you said you came to Washington to teach your son what democracy looks like. Yes. Um, what does democracy look like? Uh, I mean, it looks like this, and then these things lead to change. Then um, we realize the errors, uh, the paths that we've gone down erroneously, and we correct them. We put the power back in the people's hands. People across the country see us. They start talking. Uh, they realize that they are us. We are all the 99%. And uh, the country's awakened and things change. Now, you made a, finally got to give your witness statement today. <laughs> I did. I think you tried again, uh, what, Saturday night? Yes. And they didn't accept it, but they right. did accept it today. And yes. you said they were nice to you today. They were, yes. Okay. So are you going to stay in touch, make sure to follow up? Did yeah, they, absolutely. Uh, I, I, of course, am going to make sure that they continue and follow through with what they need to do and uh, that you know the, the proper things are done. I think, though, that it is important because I do get to go back to Dayton. And, uh, are you going to occupy Dayton? We are occupying Dayton. Okay. Yes, uh, we are occupying Dayton. It's a small group, but, you know, small it's, town? it's a, it's a, a small, small group. town. That's right. And uh, I get to go back there, but I leave a lot of uh, these guys who have helped us uh, get our justice uh, behind. And I think that it's important that the police and the protesters find uh, some peace, uh, peaceful ground in this. I know the uh, police department probably feels like they lost a lot of face today. When you have 50 people that have to demand you do your job, that, that happens. But, but, but we uh, have let's to give them credit. When you push them up against the wall, they did do they the did right do it. thing. Yeah, they did the right and, thing. And uh, I'm glad they're following their own procedures, and I hope they continue to follow their yep. own procedures. You know, when a crime has been committed, it's the job of the police officers not to, to decide who's right and who's wrong right there. That's the job of the district attorney and the jury and the judges, the justice system. It's the job of cops simply to get all the witness statements together yes. and determine what happened. I want to thank uh, both of you. I'll thank you, Michael Patrick. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, it's Heidi Sipple. I want to thank your son, Landon Sipple. Yeah. I want to thank Drew Bessie. And I want to thank uh, Todd Waters for coming here. Tomorrow night on the Raucous Caucus, 89.3 FM, from 7 to 8 p.m., we're going to have Heidi back and some of these witnesses uh, address another audience. At that time, you are welcome to call in and share your point of view. For now, this is Mark Levine signing off.